In this lecture, we'll discuss identifying and seizing digital evidence. We have four specific objectives and topics for today's lecture. The first is we'll talk about identifying types of digital evidence. We'll talk about securing the scene. Uh, if it's a crime scene, obviously, we're expecting that a crime might have been committed there. And so we'll need to make sure that either we, as forensic examiners, or an outsider doesn't come in and accidentally change any of the evidence. We'll talk about the importance of documenting what you do. And finally, as a prelude to talking about forensic duplication, we'll talk about whether to unplug a running computer or not. Now, in a previous lecture, I already discussed differences between, let's say, a, a law enforcement or a crime scene where law enforcement is involved and in private industry. So, the, uh, the exact procedures that you used and whether a uh, court order or search warrant is required will depend upon you know which of those scenarios that you're in. However, what's not going to change is the fact that digital evidence is going to be involved in pretty much every case you can think of, whether it's, it's a case in private industry or a case in law enforcement. And if you think back, a lot of you are going to be really young and so you don't remember there's always been, or at least you can always remember, cell phones um, and iPods and things of that nature. But as far back or as, uh, as the 1990s and earlier, we didn't have all these different types of digital evidence. We have external hard drives. You know, an external hard drive now could hold as much as uh, two, three, or four terabytes of information. We have camera, digital cameras. Uh, we have uh, removable devices, USB devices. Here you see on the screen is a uh, Victronics uh, Swiss Army knife that also doubles as a USB flash drive. And it's, it's, a, it's an old one. It only holds 64 megabytes, but I believe they now have one that can hold a terabyte of information. And I think that's like $3,200, so they're probably not going to be uh, that widespread. But still... That's not something that you think offhand as um, just from glancing at it, if it wasn't open, that it might hold digital evidence. And then we have, um, here I've got an iPod, uh, first or second generation iPod. What do those hold? Well, we think of mainly music, but they also hold, they can hold movies. They can hold pictures. They can hold contact information, all different types of evidence. And then you have, see so you have a, a cell phone here, and you have a CD drive and uh, I believe that's a compact flash drive. And the, the, it's when you're identifying digital evidence at the scene of a crime, you, the most obvious thing is going to be a laptop sitting there or a computer, but think of all the other types of media or devices that can hold digital evidence. If you're asked to go in and seize digital evidence, then you need to be aware of everything uh, in the surrounding area that might have potential for holding evidence. Recall in an earlier lecture, I talked about making sure that you don't change anything. And this is no different than when forensic examiners who are working with biological or physical data is that they put, um, they put gloves on, they may even put hair nets on or uh, little uh, removable booties so that they, we're processing the crime scene is that nothing is left at the crime scene that may contaminate the evidence. And the same thing goes with the uh, evidence where it's primarily digital evidence, is we want to make sure that we secure the area and we don't change any of that digital evidence. For example, if we have a, an external hard drive that's sitting off you know, to the side like this, we don't want to plug that in. And the reason is, is that most operating systems will auto-mount devices, whether you're plugging in you know, the, uh, the external hard drive or the uh, USB device or an iPod or an iPad and it can change the evidence. So we want to make sure that we don't do that. So we want to secure those things which might change. One of the easy ways to start documenting the crime scene is to take a, a camera like you see here or the camera on a cell phone and just start taking photos. Usually law enforcement uses a dedicated camera in which to do that. But you want to document the crime scene to show where everything was 
at the time that you found it. It's also good uh, to take photographs of the system components, for example, uh, a monitor, the back of the CPU, papers, disks, peripherals, so you can document that in fact that when you arrived at the crime scene that those devices were there and whether they were connected or not. That may be important. It's also important to inventory the items that you find and that you're going to seize, even down to the point of tagging each cable showing where the endpoints, where the cable started, where it ended. And here's just a simple example of what bagging and tagging looks like from a, from a, a criminal a law enforcement point of view is that you have evidence bags and if you've ever watched CSI you know that any type of evidence is put in bags they're sealed and then the uh, the crime scene specialist will write down the appropriate information including uh, what the item is if it has a serial number you can put that on it you can see right here it's kind of hard to see that the uh, the serial number was written down on here who collected it when they collected it uh, where it was located I'll make this a little bigger. There we go. And also the chain of custody. So essentially, who's the person responsible for, for gathering the evidence? Notice the date and the time. And notice that this says a reason. And notice that there's multiple lines on here so that when the next person comes to, to perhaps uh, check out the, the evidence from the evidence custodian, is that they can indicate that they were now in possession of the bag. And that's a very important uh, concept in law enforcement is the chain of custody. We've already touched on this in a previous lecture, but let's, let's revisit this just for a moment. We know that when we're talking about forensics, we're talking about uh, the, the legal arena, and we talk about evidence, we're talking about the possibility of a crime. And so when we talk about digital evidence, we're usually thinking in terms of denoting something pertaining to a crime and the law and the legal arena. But perhaps someone hasn't broken a law, but they violated an acceptable use policy, and let's say an email policy or storing information or uh, sending out harassing emails to coworkers, which may violate a company's acceptable use policy. This may not be illegal, however, this could be cause to get the person fired. Is that evidence? Well, maybe in a lay sense we could call that evidence, but sometimes we call those artifacts of the case, uh, you know, and a good example of the difference between evidence and an artifact is uh, if somebody's storing child pornography, which is against the law, on a computer, that would be considered evidence of a crime. However, pornography, uh, at least in the United States, as far as I know, is not illegal. However, if somebody's uh, using their work computer to store pornography, then that could be a violation of the acceptable use policy and could cause that person to get fired. But the important point to consider here is, is either way you want to be meticulous in the procedures you use to gather the evidence to make sure that nothing changes so that when, if you do have to get on the stand to testify is that you can say that the, the evidence as you found it is exactly the same as the copy that you made and on which you work to gather the information from it. So we're going to find digital, this says electronic stuff, digital stuff, digital artifacts, evidence, whatever you want to call it. How do you deal with it? Let's, let's skip back up here to the two scenarios. Is that one, is, it's, is the top one is a law enforcement setting and a possible uh, crime being committed. However, in the bottom, we have a scenario from private industry where an employee is suspected of copying sensitive information to a remo removal device and selling it to, to another company. Maybe that's not against the law. Maybe it's just against the, the contract that the person signed saying that they have a non-disclosure agreement and they can't sell, copy, or share any sensitive information. So are you going to, as a computer security specialist, deal with that setting exactly the same as you would the setting above which dealt with law enforcement? Well, you might not know whether the employee broke a law, right? I mean, he's suspected of, of copying sensitive information, but what if he has other things on his computer that might not only violate acceptable use policy, but also that would be against the law? And that's why, as, as you probably noted in the textbook, that it's, if, if possible, it's, it's always good to try. You might want to deal with the situation 
just assuming that a crime might have been committed. Uh, so if you do know that a crime was committed, you should contact the authorities immediately as that would allow them to obtain a search warrant and to seize the evidence. But let's say that you know that somebody violated an acceptable use policy. Uh, it, might, it might not be a big criminal deal, but it's something that might cause the person to get fired. You might be able to deal with that in-house. There's no downside in treating the scene as if it might potentially be a crime scene. And that is going back and documenting everything. Uh, you might not have bag and tag bags, but at least you could document what you found, how you found it, and make sure none of the the, um, the data changes. For example, if a laptop is sitting there and it's off, you wouldn't want to, to boot it up because what that's going to do is that's going to change a lot of the information on the hard drive. So essentially what I'm saying is, is follow best practices. It's, it's, it's easy to do. It's not that difficult. And don't be sloppy and just make sure you document what you do. So the court order indicates that you are to collect all types of of evidence, which means you can seize the computer intact. So if you do that, first thing you want to do is is to make sure that you secure the system. You would check the floppy and CD drives. Is is there anything in there? Make sure of that. If there's not, if there is, you can take those out and you can put those in a bag and tag bag. And then you seal the floppy and CD drives and you can place tape across them, including on the power button and the cable connectors and things like that. And you can label them to make sure that you know how to go back and reconnect the, um, the cables once you get back to the, the lab. And there have been several court cases in the past few years where, the, um, where a judge would allow law enforcement to conduct a search and seizure of the evidence, but they would not allow them to take their computers because usually their computers was, were part of their business and in, if you took all the computers that means that the person would be out of business. And so while you might be allowed to uh, take evidence, let's say from a server or something like that, you're not allowed to seize the computer. And so if you're, the computer is not to be seized, you should carefully open the case uh, take photographs to show that hard drives were connected or where they were disconnected. You can disconnect the power leads to the hard drive and then if you're allowed to do some imaging of that hard drive you can do that there on the spot. But that's going to be less and less likely because as hard drives um, become larger and larger, you know, for a terabyte it could take several hours to image a hard drive of that capacity. And so once again this is going to depend upon what you find at the crime scene, whether you're going to be allowed to seize the computer, whether you have the capability of imaging a very large hard drive. So how does, how does a crime scene specialist secure a homicide crime scene? Well, they put yellow tape around it, right? And then they only allow an authorized trained personnel inside the scene, and then they wear gloves, they may wear hairnets and booties to make sure they're not changing the evidence. Well, how do you secure a computer crime scene? What, that is, what is the equivalent of the yellow tape surrounding the scene to make sure that you're not changing the evidence? Well, the, in the 80s and 90s, the theory was that the best way to stop any further changes from occurring or accidentally um, doing something that would make changes to the evidence was to pull the plug, that is, uh, shut down the system just by pulling out the electrical cable. And what this does is it, it, the computer shuts down dirty regardless of the OS. And by dirty, um, there's something called a dirty bit on, on every uh, file system. And what that shows is, is whether there was a graceful shutdown of the system or not. If there's a graceful shutdown of the system, that is, in, for example, in Windows, you go to the uh, Start menu and then you click Stop. All the changes that, that are, uh, have yet to be made and not written out to the hard drive are written out to the hard drive. The modified access times are changed and the system shuts down. If it shuts down dirty, that means that the system was not able to write all those changes out to the hard drive. But by doing this, you can then use a, bo a bootable uh, 
let's say Linux CD to mount the hard drive read only to create forensics imaging or do a quick analysis of what's on the system. So what's the problem with this? Well, what if there's ongoing activity? You know, what, what if a, um, a, a document is open on the screen or what if there's important information in RAM? Uh, what if there are important network connections? That is, maybe somebody's downloading something or uploading something that is part of the crime scene. Well, if you pull the plug, you lose all that information. And that's called volatile evidence. Is it evidence that is changing? And uh, as we know, the contents of RAM are going to be continually changing. We have network connections. We have lots of different types of evidence that could be lost should we just pull the plug. So what are the issues here? If there's ongoing activity, we lose volatile evidence. If we power down... Uh, gracefully, it causes hundreds of files to change. Powering on uh, causes hundreds of files to change. Leaving the computer on results in changes. So the theory is, is don't just automatically shut down. Don't pull the plug. You need to investigate first. You need to know if there's anything that's ongoing. You know, Try to get information from the suspect if you can. Look on screen. Is there anything going on on screen that may indicate that illegal activity is going on? It may be in RAM that you might want to pull out. And so your response strategy will determine whether to unplug the computer or not. Now, if, if you know that you're going to need to do a full forensics examination, which means you need a, something called a forensics image, a forensic duplicate, or a bitstream copy, that all means the same thing, that means that you're getting every sector of the piece of media, and, and that would include all the, the system information, the actual files, deleted files, something called slack space that will... Uh, talk about later on, and that's going to be that's going to require that the system be shut down. Now, if there is ongoing activity, and you have some reason to believe that there's information in RAM or the network connect connections that may be of use to the case, then you'll need to do something called a live response. And uh, we'll touch on this later on. We won't go into it too completely, but the procedures, the, the actual technical procedures that are used in each of those is a little different. So if you know that you need a full forensics image, you must perform a shutdown. So you unplug the network cable, unplug the power cable. The system will shut down uncleanly. That just means it will be dirty. Uh, you've probably already experienced that with a computer is that for some reason your your system froze and that you had to uh, turn the power off to your system and then reboot it and then it goes through a check disk procedure when you start back up that just meant that the system did shut down uncleanly and the dirty bit was set and that's something that's built into operating systems and file systems to make sure that they they perform as required and can uh, reconfigure themselves and so what are the other types of me media that you need to create an image of? Well, it could be the hard drives, floppy drives, CDs, DVDs, cell phones, USB thumb drives, all different types of media. If there's a possibility that there's evidence on that, you need to seize it, bag it, tag it, and then create an image of it. Uh, also with respect to hard drives, uh, because they're more complicated than, than the smaller you know, CDs and DVDs and USB flash drives is you can need information on the number and type of partitions, the hard drive geometry and so on, but that's something we'll talk about in a later lecture. And then here's some of the good references I used, and this isn't all the references, the, some of the things that I'm uh, talking about in here uh, came from many sources and also from speaking to law enforcement agents uh, throughout the United States. One of the really good uh, documents that talks about the best practices of seizing electronic evidence is, is free, and it was written by the U.S. Secret Service. The newest version of that document is version 3. It's available in a PDF. I'm not going to point to it because it's in several places, but if you go out and you search for best practices for seizing electronic evidence, you should be able to download that for free.